one-for-one -one replica of a museum sword for less than a grand? Sounds like a dream come true. Hello, this is Kyle, also known as AlienTube, and today I am reviewing the Windless Royal Armory's Matt Easton Collaboration Wakefield Hanger. Now before I get started, I should mention that you will probably notice a very small chip on the false edge on this sword. That is 100% my fault and should in no way reflect on Windless or the sword in general. So a little background about this sword and how it came about. This is a collaboration between Windless, the Royal Armories, and Matt Easton, or Scala Gladiatoria as you probably are familiar with them. What happened is that Matt Easton took detailed measurements of a variety of swords in the Royal Armories, very detailed measurements, down to the thickness all over the blade. Every, practically every little detail he took measurements of. He provided those measurements to Windless, and then they made replicas based off of them. There were a good number of revisions to the product, as whenever Windless would make one, it had to pass both Matt Easton and the Royal Armory's inspection to make sure that they were as close as possible to the original. There were also some design decisions that went through a couple revisions, like this counter guard here had a couple different versions that, because the original looks like it might have been broken off, so they're not sure if it was a full-on uh, D-guard here, if it just swept up, swept back. None of it is entirely clear because it looks like the original is a little bit off. So I know at one point they had the full D-guard and then eventually ended up switching to this, just, just this straight lug. Matt Easton also designed the grips because I believe on all of the ones that they chose, the grips did not survive. That's totally normal for historical swords. In fact, it's extremely rare for a historical sword to still have the grip. So Matt Easton designed the grips as something that he thinks would be fitting for that style of sword. So this specific sword is based on IX.144 at the Royal Armories in Leeds, and it's designed to be a one-for-one -one replica of that sword. It sells new for just under $600 at Museum Replicas Limited, and it cannot be sharpened by them. It is sold blunt, and I believe that's because at the Royal Armories, they're selling these at their, their museum shop, and that there's some legality there keeping it from ever being sharpened. In fact, Museum Replicas Limited will normally allow you to have them sharpen pretty much any of the swords they sell for around $20, $30, I don't remember the exact price. They won't do that on these. It's not, they will not allow it. That doesn't mean that these are your typical windless edges though. These are actually very finely ground to a very close edge that just not doesn't have that final apexing done to make it truly sharp. I actually had this one sent directly to my friend Matthew Cross. I will link his YouTube channel in the description and he sharpened it for me. According to him when he got it, he thinks it would have cut to Tommy straight out of the box. So that's already pretty damn sharp. So if this is intended to be a one-for-one -one replica of a sword in a museum, I figure I should do some comparisons of them. Now, keep in mind, I obviously don't have access to the original. All I can do is look at the pictures on the uh, Royal Armory's website, which while they are high resolution and good pictures, they're still just 2D representations and they don't tell the whole story. And what's more, all I'm gonna be talking about is how this one sword compares to what I can glean from those pictures and the stats that are listed on the Royal Armories. There might be differences with other people who get the same sword. I don't have any way of knowing. And in addition, I'll compare them to Museum Replica Limited's measurements and specifications that they provide. So a bit earlier than normal for my reviews, here's the measurements I took. So the Royal Armories lists the blade length at 68 centimeters, the overall length at 80.3, and the weight at 765 grams. Now since this is how they're listed at the museum, I'm going to keep using the metric during my description here. For windless, they list the blade length at 69.2 centimeters and the overall length at 81.3 and the weight at 878 grams. My measurements are 68.5 centimeter blade length, 80 centimeter overall length, and a weight of 736 grams. So one important thing to mention about the Royal Armory sword is that there is some metal loss and no grip. That's going to decrease the weight some. 
What that means, however, is that my sword, which already weighs about 30 grams less than the original, is probably a bit too much on the light side to be a true one-to-one -one replica. It's not a huge difference, but it is there. That is, of course, if the Royal Armory's measurements are accurate. It's also important to note that sharpening of this sword would have reduced the weight a little bit, but we're not talking very much metal here. Now, when we compare them to Museum Replica Limited stats, they're pretty much off by quite a bit, especially the weight. And frankly, I attribute that to both Windless and Museum Replicas Limited not doing a good job of representing the stats of the sword. They're not particularly good at it. So a question comes, how important is it for this sword to be a one-for-one -one replica? Is it close? Is it exact? Does it need to be exactly the same? Frankly, I think it's within the margin of error and therefore it's good enough. It's very much nails the overall look of this style of sword, uh, which is a Wakefield hanger. And no, it's not gonna be exactly the same, but it's close. And that's honestly good enough, especially at this price point. Let's do a pretty short visual comparison between this sword and the uh, pictures in the Royal Armories. Keep in mind, these are just my observations. They're not even necessarily criticisms, just things I've noticed. The first thing that I notice is that the folders look a little bit different. On the original, it looks like it ends at the transition to the clip point, whereas on the windless one, it actually does this really cool thing where it, the bottom edge of the fuller becomes the central spine of the blade, the thickest part of the blade, and it's actually where the edge bevel for the false edge begins. And I think that's actually a really cool transition, so I actually like that that did it, even if that's not the case on the original. The upswept quillin on the original looks like it might be a little bit more angular than the one here, and the end of the knuckle bow looks like it might be twisted on the original. It's kind of hard to tell, but it does look a little bit different. And in any case, the termination near the pommel definitely looks different. So like I said, these are just some very minor observations I made based on the pictures of the original and the one that I have. These aren't even necessarily criticisms, just things I wanted to point out that I noticed. So this does come with a scabbard, and unlike most windless scabbards, which are actually just leather sheaths, this is wood core. It's got a pretty thick leather on it, a little thicker than I'm used to for scabbards, but this is pretty normal for Windless's newer scabbards that they've been doing on things like Balor Arms, where they've been putting kind of a thick leather around uh, the wood core. The fit is very good. There's absolutely no rattle. I can hold it upside down, shake it. It's not coming out at all. It's actually probably a little tight. You can see I kind of had to yank it a little bit. And to put it back in, it only goes in that far. If I want to get it all the way in, I have to kind of give it an extra push. It's not a big deal. You know, fit varies in climate. So... This is perfectly acceptable to me. It comes with a bronze shape, and I really appreciate it when makers use bronze for their shapes because it was far more common historically for them to be bronze, if they even had a shape, than to be steel. This is a bit of a plain shape for the time period. It probably should be a little bit more ornate to be histo truly historically accurate, but it's still a nice looking shape. You know, I like this scabbard enough that I am I have plans to get it customized, so that'll be a really cool thing to show in a future video. Taking a look at the hilt, the grip is a huge improvement over a typical windlass. It's got the cord wrap texture and nice risers here. Now these risers, they're pretty well defined, but they could be even better at this price point. The original Valor Arms manufacturer, uh, OTC, definitely has a leg up on windless on that. That's not to say that these are bad, just that they could be better. The seam runs right down the interior of the grip and it's a little noticeable. It's not stitched like most windless grips, but it is raised up a little bit. And I think what is happening there is that they're not skiving the edges of the leather or doing a counter wrap on it to really make that seam as nearly unobtrusive as possible. And as you can see, this grip is quite small. It's not even three inches long, which means you end up, when you hold it, you end up using the pommel as part of the grip. There's just no way around that. I don't think maybe a kid 
could hold this without using the pommel, but for the most part, any adult is go definitely going to be using the pommel as part of the grip. And after doing the, some cutting, here's a few thoughts I've had about the comfort of the grip. So the one thing I notice is that right here, the pommel kind of digs into the palm just a little bit. It's not terrible, it's just a little uncomfortable when I cut and I impact and it kind of rotates a little bit and kind of just digs into the palm a little bit. I, my friend Kane Shen had a lot of problems with the risers and the seam really tearing up his fingers. This one doesn't have that problem at all, so that's a good thing. It would be nice if this part of the pommel was just a little more rounded. It's pretty sharp here. The pommel is nicely formed with a nice even finish and a good amount of dimension and chamfering to the interior of it. But like I mentioned just a moment ago, this outer part could be chamfered better. The peen is pretty much normal for windless, which is to say it's smoothed over nicely, but there's pretty much no attention given to try to shape it attractively. This is a matter of function over form. You know, at a higher price point, you expect to the peen to be shaped nicely. Windless has just never done that, and I don't think they particularly care to do that. And that's not to say that's a bad thing, it's just something I've noticed. The cross guard is also nicely formed, and there's absolutely no hot spots anywhere that, for me at least, I didn't notice any problems with that. It's got a nice even finish everywhere except right where this little lug sticks out. This looks like it has been welded on to me, and then the welds ground down and smoothed out. I don't know if that's true, that's just what it looks like to me, and I have no idea how historically accurate that is. I know if this were a messer, this would be peened through the entire guard. This one, there's absolutely no indication that there's a peen here. And when this, as I was mentioning on the peen on the pommel, when this doesn't clean up their peens enough that I would believe it to be invisible here. So this is definitely not peened through. I really do think it was welded on. The gap in the cross guard is fine. You know, it, it fits the blade decently. It's not shaped exactly to the shape of the blade, but you know, that's an aesthetic choice. Personally, I would prefer to see it a little bit more shaped, a little bit tighter fit, but it's not a real problem. Now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. Once again, I'll put the measurements I took of it up on screen. So as you can see, the blade is 27 inches long and the clip point or false edge, whatever you want to call it, starts just after 17 inches. It starts one and a half inches wide and just under six millimeters thick and pretty much doesn't taper either of those very much until the clip point starts, at which point it starts rapidly thinning down to just around two and a half millimeters at, near the tip. This leads to a blade that has some flex to it. You can see it flexes pretty much right where that transition is, which is what you'd expect. And that makes the that point pretty much the, the sweet spot for cutting. This is an excellent geometry for cutting, and it makes for a very light and nimble sword that can be moved around really easily. One thing that I've seen other people complain about is the amount of maker's marks on the, the sword. You know, you've got your typical windlass made in India stamp here. You have I'm not sure what, this is a true maker's mark, I'm not sure exactly what it refers to. And then you have the Royal Armory stamp here. I believe these two, the Royal Armories and the Windless Made in India, could be cleaned off pretty easily with a little bit of elbow grease, whereas this maker's mark is going to be a lot more sticky, if you will. The finish on the blade is a nice, even satin all along the blade. Very nicely done, a better finish than most Windless swords I've seen. Now this is clearly a handmade piece. The fullers wobble around, especially at this, the transition to the clip point, and there's a good amount of rippling on the blade. Now since Matt Easton has done a couple videos about rippling on the blade, I figure I should address it a little bit. First off, I want to say that rippling in the blade is generally speaking a leftover from grinding the blade, not forging. This is coming from a couple different bladesmiths that said as much in response to his videos. So when I review swords, why do I talk about the rippling in the blade? Well, as Matt said in his video, sometimes if there's excessive rippling, it could actually cause issues with the performance of the sword. You know, if there's too much rippling and the ripples are too deep, 
then it could affect the flexibility and the performance of the sword. Personally, the only sword that I've had that be the case was on a, the Balor Arms 14th century longsword that I reviewed, where there was a ripple deep enough right around the end of the fuller that it actually weakened the blade structure there and it took a set. And that's the only sword that I've had that rippling seemed to truly cause an issue. But really, the main reason I talk about rippling is to describe it to you. I want you to know what the sword looks like and what you can expect to get. And rippling is actually can be really difficult to get captured on camera. So I do my best on it, but I'm just sometimes I just can't seem to capture it the way it looks when I'm looking down the blade. So I try to do my best to explain it in case it matters to you. To me, I would like to see less rippling because it shows attention to detail and a little bit more care and effort put into the blade. And the higher price the sword, the less rippling there should be because you're paying for extra effort on the sword and creating a really smooth, even surface is extra effort. You know, on a couple hundred dollar sword, I don't expect them to take that time to make this super smooth. But when you're paying, for instance, Albion level swords, I expect there to be pretty much no rippling, maybe a little bit here and there. Now on this windlass, this is going to be mid-range, you know, in the six, seven hundred dollar range. I would expect there to be less rippling than on budgets, but swords, but still some rippling. This one has probably a little bit more rippling than what I would consider truly acceptable at this price point. That's not to say that's a deal breaker on this sword. That's not. It's just one of the things I consider when I talk about whether the sword is worth it to me personally. But that's enough about rippling. Let's talk about the edge beveling, which is something Winless did superbly here. This is the best edge beveling I've ever seen Winless do. It's one smooth bevel from the end of the fuller all the way to the edge. And Winless typically, their bevels leave the edge pretty thick, which means you have to have a pretty obtuse angle to when you sharpen it, or you have to spend a lot of time slowly removing metal to eventually apple seed the edge into a good workable edge. This, my friend Matthew Cross did the sharpening on it, and he said it could cut tatami right out of the box, he thinks. And he didn't have to do much work to get a very small micro bevel on here and get this ferociously sharp. Personally, I am really happy to see Windless pull off this type of edge beveling, and I hope they take this improvement and apply it to the rest of their lineup, not just the Royal Armory Swords. So how sharp is it? Well, keep in mind this is not a test of the windless blade. This is more a testament to Matthew Cross's sharpening. That was just the tip and it cuts very easily there. Very smooth sharpening, or cut right there. This cuts through paper like it's not even there. This is very, very sharp. I would test the false edge. It was not quite as sharp there but the nick in it that I put there by my clumsiness kind of ruins the sharpening there, so I'm not gonna do that. Suffice to say, it was quite sharp as well, just not as sharp and harder to cut with because the edge bevel is considerably different. During video editing, I took the sword back out for some additional photography and I noticed a little bit of damage to the edge. This looks to me like a couple of very small rolls on the edge just a little bit of deformation, and I'm not sure what caused it. I really only cut water bottles and pool noodles with this sword, so it's rather strange that it took this bit of damage. It doesn't seem to be affecting the sword's sharpness at all. I did some additional paper cutting with it just to check, and it still cuts just as well as the footage you just saw. So I'm not sure what to make of it. It is a little discouraging to me because you know, cutting water bottles and pool noodles shouldn't really damage an edge. But it's there, I've noticed it, I should let you know. So let's take a look at some cutting footage. I've done some pool noodles and water bottles.
frankly, this sword is just amazingly fun to use. It is light, nimble, with superb tip control, and just an absolute joy to cut bottles and cut pools, cut anything with, honestly. I love using this, and frankly, I get more silent cuts with this sword than pretty much any other one. So let's take a look at a few areas that I think could be improved. First off, I think the grip, they could put a little bit more care into it by skiving the seam and doing a counter wrap on it to just bring the seam down a little bit and make it less obtrusive. Secondly, a little bit more care in the finish of the blade, reducing the rippling a little bit. Now, I don't need it to be ripple free, but it would be nice to put just a little bit more care into it and I think it would go a long way. Lastly, this sword might need to be just a little bit heavier to be accurate to the original. And now it's time to talk bottom line. This sword costs just under $600. Is it worth that price? Absolutely, 100%, it's worth the price. First off, there's very few examples of Wakefield hangers in the replica market. I believe Delton has one, but I've looked at it and it looks like it's kind of overweight at two pounds, four ounces. This is a very accurate replica, maybe not a true one-to-one, -one, but very close, at a price range that you just don't see that. Normally, to get this accurate of a replica, you're going to need to be spending $1,500 or more. Aside from that, though, this entire Royal Armory's collaboration line is an entry into the mid-range price of swords, around $350 to $600, $700, I would consider mid-range. There's just not a lot of swords in that price range, and I'm really happy to see Windless entering it and upping their game. Perhaps the best way to explain it, though, is that whenever I handle the sword, I just get a big grin on my face. You know, if I'm out there cutting and struggling to cut with other swords, sometimes I'll just grab this one and do a few cuts and get good clean cuts every time just because it's so fun to use. So overall, yes, it's absolutely worth it. I am very happy I bought it. It's easily the best windless sword, but also the best sword in this price range that I, I've had experience with. So it's blatantly obvious that I highly recommend this sword. And now the addendum I mentioned. Does the edge damage change my verdict? Well, not as much as you might think. Yes, it is disappointing that the sword took that small amount of damage, but it hasn't affected its performance at all. I'm still really happy I bought it, and I enjoy using it, and I still do recommend it. There is just a slight hesitation that the edge might be a little prone to damage. And that's going to wrap up this review. Thank you for watching, and thank you Matt Easton, the Royal Armories, and Windless for producing such a great sword. This is an exciting development in the market, and I can't wait to see if more swords come out of this collaboration. Until next time, Alien 2 Dow.